big twice for sponsors. We don't do the ad reads with you here. They're just simple edit stops. And yeah. those are soft breaks. So Adam or I will just announce a break. Um, it's not radio style, intro, outro, real fancy stuff. So that'll happen twice. It's a good chance to go to the bathroom and get a drink. Mm-hmm. Or sometimes we'll back channel and talk about kind yeah. of where we want to go next with the conversation. Can I ask you guys what, what you guys do for a living? <laughs> Is this, this, this is not your full time, or is it? You're looking at it. Oh yeah, this is what we do. Very cool. It is now, yeah. So we've been doing it for a very long time. It's been. Mm-hmm. He froze up. We've been doing this for ten years, and uh, I'd say I came on full time to the company in 2015, hmm. and Jared came on full time a year ago. Mm-hmm. Just past a year ago, you froze up, so I I carried on. Oh, good. I'm actually concerned that I might be freezing up uh, intermittently because we are in a blizzard here. So if I do, just, no, just I might turn my video off eventually. But if I if I keep cutting out, just trek forward without me or yeah. yeah. Do you guys focus on on software a lot, or just primarily software, or you got all you're all over the place, different topics, or just primarily like a technology hacker type audience, if, leadership, enterprise, software. Yeah, software is our space but we kind of like move around inside of that world. We started in the open source mm-hmm. world uh, first and foremost. So like you came across our radar because of a listener who requested you to come on because mm-hmm. of your open source ecology stuff and how there's a lot of spiritual overlaps with what you're doing. And kind of like anytime we can see like real world analog uses of open source ideas, it's a cool show. Um, but we're mostly software focused and open source oriented. Um, not real enterprisey, but just kind of curious and mm-hmm. Uh, hacker hacker culture ideas are things mm-hmm. that we makers creators. Our Tata Enterprise generally is the people we talk to tend to work in enterprisey ish businesses. Yeah. Not so much that we speak to them. We mm-hmm. tend to just reach the people who work within them. And in some cases, we reach them. It depends. But mm-hmm. our mainstream shows aren't really focused on enterprise content. And what's your viewership? How many followers you got? Uh. At, at the network level, we're probably at around 75, 80,000 listens um, a week. 80, you know, that's probably a big high there. But this show in particular is around 25,000, 30,000 on a good listenership for it. So we have yeah. other shows, more than just this show. What other shows do you have, by the way? Uh, Go Time, JS Party, Brain Science, Practically I, Founders Talk, Backstage, Dark Mode. Brain uh, science is that and quirks. peak performance? It's about the brain. Yeah, it's about the brain. It's more of a psychological show, but more so on less about what we know about the brain, but more how can we use what we know about the brain to transform our lives. So habit formation, behavior change, team dynamics, mm-hmm. motivation, productivity, habit you know, habit formation can be said twice, sure. Why not? You ever you ever get into general semantics, like how meaning is constructed? Stuff like that, or not really? Maybe tangentially. How many? Mm-hmm. I mean, that would more stem from like the pillars of someone's life, mm-hmm. you know, to some degree, maybe rather than just simply on its like how meaning is constructed. I suppose how consciousness is and what it is. Yeah. That's a bit more um, less tangible than, say, actionable things like, hey, uh, I've got imposter syndrome. I'm having trouble showing up. I've got anxiety rather than. You know, how do I make meaning of my life, or what is the meaning yeah. of life? Less around that and more on applicable mm-hmm. scenarios. Well, that might come up, but it's just yeah. more of a sub-subject versus, like, uh, the kind of primary theme. Yeah. Cool. cool. Any other questions? No, I think that's <laughs> about. Cool. Um, if there's anything in particular you want us to talk about that is like not coming up naturally, or if you have something yeah. you're about to announce or want to talk about, let us know now. We're happy to work stuff in. Yeah. The show is generally meant to be conversational. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, I think I think we can run with that. Mm-hmm. We'll inject things as needed. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So we um, we do ask you to record. Okay. OBS, I, I got OBS I'm recording with. Yep. Nice.
Yeah, but the DSLR just makes up for all of that. <laughs> Serious. Yeah. No, I just got I I got three three cam three good cameras just recently to get all the videos of all the stuff we're building right now. So yeah. And, well, actually, the uh, with uh, your Canon. So I got the D six six D. The 6D and, and yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I got yeah. I got a couple of SL3s because they have automatic uh, time lapse features built in, so that's that's the kind of thing we really like. Yeah, but yeah, I'm open to new learning. I'm sure that I was kind of like frustrated with the amount of control you have over the software. I mean, you don't. It's like that's why they came up with what is that open source software suite that you later? Yeah, I mean, you know the yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, you know, there's a project out there that does that already. Axiom. Oh. Oh, for Canon. Um, it escapes me right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's, I was referring to the Apertus, Axiom Apertus, the project from Austria that they actually got the open source cinema hardware that costs like 5K as opposed to like, you know, 15K or 30, 50K. So yeah, they got a high performance, uh, basically cinema grade camera that's fully open source with all, all the schematics open and everything. Yeah. Yeah, but this gets into like if we get into our conversation here, the large, much larger picture of everyone getting to excellence, right? And that's the whole call for open source and how we approach it in hardware. But it's like you might have one player that's superior and everyone kind of lags. But what if everybody shared the knowledge so that we can all do that and what's a, what's after that? So we raise the whole level of play for everybody. So that's that's the <laughs> that's. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Are we is this part of the show or this is prelude? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, thanks Josh for recommending me. That's great.
Oh. <laughs> okay. I would have liked Innovation Stuntman better, but okay. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what's the story behind there, behind the Global Village Construction set, the work that we're doing? It's about creating an open, open collaborative paradigm for how we do product development in general. So that's, that's the current work we do. And the story started with uh, On the Ground, where after a PhD program, I got a PhD in Fusion, I was totally alienated from the work that I was doing because I felt I was getting f more and farther removed from relevant pressing world issues. So I started a farm in Missouri and then I started doing some farming. Uh, basically a, an experiment to see, okay, what would a com community that actually does things right look like? So started with some farming and uh, things like that. Got a tractor, then it broke, paid to get it repaired. Um, then it broke again. Pretty soon I was broke too. So I learned that I had all my fancy degrees and all that, and I learned I had no practical skills. There is really no good equipment and uh, tools and techniques that I needed to, to do this work just weren't around, either expensive or proprietary. So, so I started thinking a lot about open source. How, how do we create a, if somebody wants to do that, how do we do that? So let's do open source with hardware. And the open source part comes from the PhD program, my, my school back in the University of Wisconsin Madison where I wasn't even allowed to talk openly about my work so to other groups because pe research groups are competing and then when I thought about it, it's like wow this is pretty wasteful uh, we cannot really learn even in an institution that's supposed to be public for the public good uh, so I, I really looked into that issue of technology and what can we do better about it? And it's really about creating an, a collaborative way to develop things as opposed to proprietary. That's a, that's a big theme that, that um, that's, that's what we're working on. Sorry, say it again. Yeah. Yeah. It's both. So, so actually, it's a combination of a few factors. So, first of all, I was completely alienated from the work that I was doing. Second, as in my group, we so we were using Max, right? And then. <laughs> Uh, somebody one day said, hey, uh, I got this Linux thing on my desktop, and they, they showed it to me. It's like, oh, wow, interesting. It's something you can download, you can modify, it's free, uh, people contribute to it. I was completely blown away because I thought there's only one or two, one, one way to do things. Like, okay, there's Mac and Windows. So when somebody showed me that, it was like, wow, there are different ways to do things. And I learned about the whole philosophy behind that project, and I started thinking, well, how do you, how do you apply that to... A, a more collaborative system like in the work that we were doing where I wasn't able to communicate openly so that that part of just thinking about really the terrible waste the reinventing of the wheel that happens that I think that was the primary driver behind it and there's also uh, the concept of just there's Madison you know it's a it's a radical it's a very progressive town so I kind of got radicalized there too much more than just my science, like so social issues and environmental issues. And uh, thinking about the world of technology, um, I was like, well, why can't we make a better life for everybody on this planet? It's just un unacceptable that some people have, and you know, a lot of people are left out of the, of the fun that we're having with our DSLR <laughs> cameras and podcasts here. Um, there's a lot of deprivation happening at the same time that the technology of humankind is so powerful and amazing. We can go to the moon, but we can't kind of arrange our uh, our human business on this planet so that everybody benefits. And that was that philosophical disconnect between, okay, me studying this fancy stuff and not being able to do really anything with it. I felt powerless. So 
started the project. I said, okay, let's start a, an experiment, a social, uh, s basically a civilization startup experiment. I mean, I, I still kind of call it this. It's, a, it's basically, how, what does it take to, to make a civilization from scratch? Uh, how do you go about that? You need some technology, you need some sociology. <laughs> so that's kind of the origin. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so definitely in, uh, you might think that, oh yeah, PhD in physics, it's like you might have some practical skills. No, I mean, wasn't prepared for any of this. This is about turning wrenches and designing things from scratch, because typically you work with established things. So it was the need, the fire in the pants to, to do something that the tractor that I bought, it was a 1970s tractor cost like 5,000 bucks, then just breaks. The transmission goes out. Uh, I got it repaired, and one week from then, it completely broke again. And I said, this is not sustainable. I can't do this. I can't have a $2,000 bill one week, and then I don't know what's gonna happen the next next time. So I said, okay, I, I'm still committed to this, this amazing experiment of seeing how technology could be appropriate, and this is the, just the very opposite of appropriate technology. So I'm saying, okay, this is a fundamental flaw here, and, and I will not be able to do this, nor will anybody else be able to do this, if we don't solve this question of appropriate technology. I mean, I studied a lot of this, like, <laughs> during the PhD program, I did not study that in my formal work, but, but nights and weekends and a lot of time uh, I spent getting into all this stuff and almost getting kicked out of my PhD program because I was doing too much of it. Uh, but then I found, no, look, there are... You know, in the theories in the books, it says, yeah, this, we need appropriate technology. But then I got my first hand look at what that really means. And it's like, you need a machine that needs to work. And it, I want to be able to fix it. I want to be able to maintain it for a lifetime, not, not be subject to planned obsolescence. Uh, so I said, okay, I'm going to build this myself, design it so that anyone can have access to it. And then, okay, the good thing that I did get from the PhD was, was the first principles thinking that you mentioned. So I said, okay, well, what's a tractor? Okay, it's, it's this box, this frame with wheels and drive and engine and some hydraulics and you start kind of reverse engineering from the ground up. But the surprise was really good. I mean, these things work. You get yourself some engines, some steel, some hydraulics and the stuff just works with very basic design. And then you want to strip it down to the most essential design that's as simple as possible, but no simpler, that still works, do, does your thing and is designed for you being the actual owner of it, you own it and you control it. So that was a definitely a breakthrough experience for me. It started actually, um, it did not start with the tractor, it started with the brick press, um, both brick press and the tractor about the same time because the fire under the pants was, okay, here's a raw piece of land that I ended up on, I need a house. I need to do some agriculture here too. So, so those two tools were the first in line, the first, very first one was the brick press which we used to build the, the first workshop, bunch of houses that we have here. Uh, but basically said, yeah, we got to, um, if we want to be in control of our destiny, we have to have some control over the, the equipment base, not be completely subject to what, what the industry is giving you. Yeah. So brick press, yeah, yeah. So the brick press is, it's an earth compact. So it takes soil from beneath your feet and it compresses that into structural block. And you can add some stabilizer, some cement to it, or you can press without any cement, but basically you get construction grade engineered material uh, from the local material. So if you have cl clay, clay soil, you can compress that and you get bricks that are between like 300 and 1000 PSI or so, which is plenty for construction. Uh, it's kind of like Adobe, but the technological version where you're compressing a regular shaped block from that. You can see plenty of videos of us pressing thousands of these and piles of these. Um, but that's that's the first machine we did. 
Yeah, so so that process is you, you build yourself a machine for a couple of thousand bucks, and then you can press material for your house. That's great. Low cost, but a lot of labor. So that was that was the learning there. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, that's essentially in there. It's been it's been uh, there th from the very beginning since the tractor broke. But I didn't we didn't call it right to repair. That kind of came out maybe a decade after that or a few years after that. Uh, but definitely completely identify with the right to repair, for example, on your tractors where now John Deere is putting proprietary equipment that you don't even own the software and if it breaks, like you're completely dependent on the service from the, from John Deere. Like there's a lot of uh, pushback from that because people are saying, hey, I don't really own this thing. This thing is owning me. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, I mean it's it's clear it's it's about control. So if you're a business in the modern system of commerce, you're beholden to your stockholders to maximize profit. One way to do that is you you concentrate information, you concentrate the services, you don't empower the customer to do all the things that would make the thing lower cost. So to give you some numbers, today a farmer will will go out and splurge with like half a million dollars worth of equipment that depreciates 10 percent per year like fifty thousand dollars per year right well so you're talking about a 10-year lifetime before you gotta snap up that <laughs> that half a million dollar deal again well think about it it's like 10 years that's you know you might say that that's pretty cool you know i grew all these beans and corn and and made this money which actually is marginal these days uh, so they're they're on this hamster wheel of of keeping up uh, with a system but then the the thing emerges well what if you had your right to repair uh, you'd absolutely drive your cost lower it would be lower cost to repair things like for example to, to give you a great example so the tractor uh, that I use right now uh, it's got modular parts it's got a modular engine unit if that thing breaks I take a take a little hoist to that and take off the power cube it's a modular hydraulic power unit with an engine I take that off and in an hour I put in another one and I'm off running again so it wasn't a week or two trip to the repairman or you know declining my productivity. It's something that I can control, very low cost. So design it to be modular lifetime design, which you can if it's open source. If you're proprietary, you're not gonna have that. You're gonna make more money as the company because you're providing that service. So um, the choice is yours, but which one will you take? <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, there's been six iterations so far. So each one is different and it improves. Yeah, it's it's constantly, we're building the next iteration this year. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, so let's 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 get a reality check here. So first of all, we don't have the fifty machines yet. We've got about eight or so prototypes or um, there's about 27 of each prototype. There's about seven or so that are at the product release stage. So for example, download our blueprints for the brick press, the tractor, the house, the 3D printer, the torch table. Make a business out of it. Go ahead. But there's only a, a handful of those right now. And the big thing right now is about the enterprise side so that you 
right now have a choice not to go to John Deere, but to the open source ecology version tractor and get that as a turnkey service. So right now I would say, you might say, okay, how do I build it? I don't know, forget about it. <laughs> no, I mean, only unless you're die hard and you're willing to go through a steep learning curve, are you gonna do this? So, but that's the thing where the, th the big surprise for me was that it's that side of the enterprise development is not taking off like the design side. Like here, we're doing this the whole time. People are not replicating, it's hard. Altogether, there's been like a dozen or two replications of about a dozen of the brick press, several of the tractor, but it's a huge different story between the prototype that you can make work and you're, you know, you're hacking it the whole time and a commercial product. So this is where we're at right now. We're at the stage of getting all this to the commercial traction stage and that's basically where we're, we're we want to succeed because right now we haven't we it, this has not succeeded you have difficulties that are probably if you give if I give you a number it's probably a thousand times harder than software um, like realistically speaking with the materials with the learning curves the the reality you're not moving electrons you're moving atoms and this is hard this is logistics this is this is parts that are completely uh, you got a thousand different parts you can choose from. The, the, you're working from a system that's got 200 years of industrial inertia of proprietary development. You're dealing with, with part suppliers that you have a whole junkyard of cars and you can't even make a single working car from all of that because all the parts are different. So there's, there's, there's some challenges. Uh, and that's why, yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and we're talking about, I mean, the learn initially I'm thinking, oh yeah, you know, TED Talk time, all this amazing interest and all of that, but it's, it's, it's a hard management thing because to take it from a prototype to the product, it's like you gotta do not like one or two prototypes, you gotta do like 10 or 100. I mean, literally, it's kind of like software where you fix a bug, done, okay, next bug, next bug, but how many bugs you have? Thousands, right? It's the same with hardware. You fix one thing, you learn a new thing, and then you can keep improving this and improving this, and it takes a long time. Now, well then how do the, the proprietary guys do that? Well, my answer to that is that their equipment is crap, in general. I mean, it's, it's pretty high performance, but it's nowhere near what it could be if you unleash a collaborative effort to do so. And that's what we're going after. Uh, explain that question. No. Exactly. No. That's exact. Yeah. No, I would say. It's a structural evil, yes. It's an incentive structure. I, I use the word structurally because we're within we're within a, a paradigm that makes this happen. Now that's very rational for for John Deere to make that tractor and not collaborate, have the best one, get some boost up the sales, and so forth. But the opposite of that is what if John Deere and Mahindra and Mahindra and that's the tr biggest tractor company in the world from India. Uh, all the other ones, Case, Bobcat, what if they all collaborate to make the super machine? Well, we can make a case that would be, it could be better. And you clearly can't say that. Like, for example, to, get, to reify that a little bit, if you go out on the internet, if you know anything about diesel engines, the people will say that there is no one perfect diesel engine. And I'm looking at that, it's like, huh, I, I thought about this, this issue. It's like, okay, is that because there's so many different options and this and that and Everyone complains about a diesel engine. Like there's whole religions, like this is my favorite diesel engine, this is my favorite diesel engine, or that one. And each one of them says that, okay, well this is better because of this, but it doesn't have this, that, and the other. And I'm saying, like, why can't it not have all? Why can it, be, can it not be actually the best engine? And that's actually a, an, an issue we're struggling with right now, because we don't really have a great engine to work from. Um, and we're going to have to open source that in the future. But that's an interesting story that the incentives there are to keep mediocrity as a status quo. We might think we have unleashed radical, crazy innovation, AI, and 
all of this, this and that. But I think we're still in a stone age until we learn to collaborate. Twenty eleven. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Finan our our revenue model is actually workshops and, and selling some of the machines. So for example, right now we sell the three D printer kits. So you can go online and buy a kit from us. That's how we bootstrap. We also run workshops where, for example, we'll take a dozen or two dozen people over a weekend and we'll, we build a 3D printer that they take home. Or we do other things like where you build, go over a weekend and build a tractor. So crazy things like that. Up to five day events where we build the CD go home. Actually, this house that I'm in right now has been built over five days with 50 people. So we do these swarm-based build, build events. So it's part of the experience economy. Both products, education, and experience economy are our revenue model. And that's, that's what we're doing. Initially, we had some, uh, started some true fans, crowdfunding, did a couple of Kickstarters. Uh, but yeah, uh, it's definitely, I mean, the next milestone is just get the revenue streams happening. Uh, we're planning to build and sell these houses. It's a model of a thousand square foot house that you can build with a friend in one week for $50,000. Or we can give you a turnkey version of that for 130k including land that's our next major milestone and we think we're going to get some traction with this because a lot of everyone wants a home <laughs> computer programmers who need practical skills survivalists uh, <laughs> there's people who want makers uh, educators it's a very very broad crowd of, of freaks from <laughs> society all over the place. Uh, both, both, uh, yeah, both, both uh, mainstream and and progressive people. It's it's a wild bunch. That basically, want uh, the common theme is there. We you know we want to take charge of learning practical skills, building things, uh, just getting away from that. Like just same thing that I faced is that you know I got my PhD and then I could not build a thing. I had no practical skills. So that, that's there's that big gap. It's also now a big political divide now, the, the huge gap between the intellectual world, the world of finance capital, and the productive people who are still in touch with producing things. Because I must say, um, from a long time ago, we, you know, we've been makers, like we've you know, lived in a jungle and, and slayed an animal, we built things. That kind of instinct is still quite deep within a lot of people. Um, everyone has that. You want to be have your agency show and the best way to show that is through manifestation of physical objects so that's the kind of drive that that unifies a lot of people that come to our workshops yeah 
Exactly, and you... No, no. No, it's... Uh, we can come back to it, and I will say that the, the track record has shown only like three dozen or so builds that we know of the heavy machines. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna say like, forget about it, just with the caveat that it's gonna be a significant learning curve. And if you don't, I think the, the big thing to say about that is if you don't have the cycle, like the, the vision behind why you're doing that, you're gonna say, wow, well, well, this is hard, you know? So that's, that's the thing. Yeah, that's definitely, you can, yeah, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm yeah actually um, yeah yeah I, c I can start no I c mm hmm exactly good good metaphor and i can talk about the because this system is designed to be bootstrapped so i can talk exactly how you start from one thing that builds the next thing that builds the next thing and before you know it you got yourself a new civilization <laughs> which is encouraging yeah <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a the one property of the system is that it's a it's a bootstrapping recursive kind of a thing where one machine builds the next one. So there's a logical sequence that we can propose right now, starting with the smaller some of the smaller things and getting to the larger things. And that would be uh, as a case example. And of course, the the first example, like a three D printer relies on a bunch of technology but but take a look at this so say you have a 3d printer with the 3d printer the way we design it we can actually make parts to produce a cnc torch table which cuts steel and then you can take that steel and in, in an automated cutting process you get all the steel for your tractor now then you take your tractor and you can build your house so you can see that there's a logical progression there uh, but of course, like at the very, very base is, okay, well, where do I get all that steel and, and the plastic and all of that too? And the answer is there's other machines that produce materials from raw feedstocks. Like the whole p point is take rocks, sand, plants, soil, water, uh, take those things and convert that to, that's where all the modern civilization comes from. So what are the machines that produce that? So we have some of the things like an induction furnace that, for example, can melt steel to generate virgin steel from scrap. So, for example, in our scenario right now, we can go uh, take all the wa waste uh, scrap metal or go to a junkyard and, and turn that into v virgin steel from your tractor. You have things like plastic extrusion, so you can do 3D printing or make the, the plastic from waste plastic. That's kind of a low-hanging fruit. Uh, plastic recycling, so you're shredding plastic, you're remelting it, making it into 3D printing filament. A rubber filament that you can print with but there's there's for each part of civilization there's a machine that does the thing like digging rocks you, you dig rocks you burn that rock and you turn it into concrete now you got your concrete foundation you can go through that kind of a simple thinking process for every single thing uh, rocks that's that's like iron ore right uh, melt it smelt it you got steel steel concrete plants you got plastics all the all the present uh, oil-based economy also can be gotten out of trees. It's carbon, 
So you got to know a little bit of chemistry for that. You got some industrial engineering there, but it's all a ra very rational. Like once you start wrapping your head around the whole process, you say, "Wow, this is really cool!" And these all these resources are all around us. This is beautiful. So that's that's the bottom line right now. I, I'm I'm in a very optimistic standpoint. I, I'm a techno utopian, but not not the Diamandis style one of AI and and computers and all of that. But more like let's get to the bottom of the resources and the whole machinery set that is open source and reproducible all over the world so so other countries can leapfrog to the same state of excellence that we have attained here and so forth yeah So let me address that one point about this is how do you make this easier for people? So the idea is it's like, Jared, I said, forget about it. Well, not if you have the local open source micro factory in your town where instead of going to Walmart and buying a thing, you can go into a place where you can get a turnkey product or sign up for a manufacturing a build where you actually build that yourself. And the thing is, when you build it yourself, now you own it. You can repair it. So the access... Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Microfactory. Open source microfactories, yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And that's the theme behind the, the maker spaces, hacker space movement. Though those kinds of spaces currently, they're not really set up for, for real industrial productivity in a small scale. It's largely an education kind of tinkering kind of a space. But basically think of the, the hacker space with a business model. Here's how we actually produce things. And the thing that's actually missing, people think that there's all this in open source hardware, there's open source this, open source that, instructables. Uh, oh yeah, you can find anything. No, it's actually not the case. For anything that's actually a very good product, very little of that exists. There are, you know, there are some stuff that's, that's out there, but um, the, the, the sad fact we run into right now is that anything that's actually really good, it tends to still hide and become proprietary. Like there's a lot of cases of open source hardware projects that kind of hid and things like that. Uh, but just to take the limit to what you have to be, do be doing is you have to be able to take metals for, for modern civilization. You have to be able to take metals, machine them, and make ball bearings. Like ball bearings, I would say, is like the number one technology that allows the world to spin, a spin around, no pun intended. I mean, it's the core of industrial machines that spin, that are, for example, like your uh, CNC mills and whatever your cars wheels so if you can make the the bearing which is a relatively simple device not too not too complex a, a grinder that takes little balls and actually grinds them into perfect shape uh, very cons at that level of type of equipment when you start thinking about oh okay ball bearing machine uh, metal processing equipment that you can actually now start making steel and the good thing is though that none of this takes mega factories of yesterday this is all doable in a very small scale facility. Like here we have a 4,000 square foot workshop. You can do all of this in the workshop. So our goal is to have that workshop. You got an induction furnace, you've got some CNC machines, you got a torch table, you got 3D printers and other hand tools. You can build just about anything. 
and it's a business model uh, to develop. Yeah. Yeah, the rollout. Yeah, uh, the rollout right now is the, the project that we're doing right now is the seed eco home, the, the house that I mentioned. And because everyone needs a house, we're thinking that's going to be a great way to generate revenue through a very efficient, lean, well, well designed thing. We've made several prototypes. We think we, we know what we're doing. But at the same time, you also say, okay, so I'm gonna start me a, a, this house building enterprise and we're gonna produce, uh, I did if everything works out, hundreds of these uh, this year, like, or at least get hundreds of orders uh, so we can execute, uh, which means we're also training people to build. But when, we, when I think about that enterprise, it's like, okay, well, what about a 3D printer or a tractor? Well, I need that tractor to do the foundation, to hoist the, you know, the lumber, move things around, to spread the gravel. So we're actually saying, okay, we're, gonna, we're developing this house, but as side projects along with that, we are launching some other campaigns so that we get the tractor to the final uh, workable version so we can lower the cost on the house business. So that's part of the house business. And the 3D printers that we've developed, we, we know we can make a lot of things that we use as materials for the house, like 3D printed plastic lumber, like uh, foundation forms that facilitate the foundation, like all this kind of stuff you can do if you have a larger printer and waste processing infrastructure for, pr for processing abundant plastic waste into, into filament. So actually, as part of the house, which is our main campaign right now, we're doing side um, the campaigns around the 3d printer and the tractor we're taking those also to the finish line so that we can reduce the cost of the housing that's our current uh, one year two year program to get these three the, the 3d printer tractor house out the door so that we can have widespread access No, I don't think so. Not yet, because they don't understand it, or they don't. No, not yet. Yeah, that is if we had thousands or millions of replications, which we don't. So until the point where you have reached a billion dollar scale or so, or at least like 10 million, you're hardly going to be noticed. Our budgets are, we've only spent over the last decade or so, it's about 2 million bucks. It's shoestring. Um, so that's part of the learnings. It's like, no, you, you put forth this design. No, people are not going to start going crazy and making all kinds of enterprises across the world like I thought would happen with the brick press or the tractor. When I first published the brick press, I thought, wow, can I publish this? Like, th people are going to steal it. They're going to, the world's going to explode with this. What am I going to do? No, it's far from it. The, 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 the thing is, it takes much more work to, to get there. And because society is missing what we call collaborative literacy is why this is not going forward. We're too used to the idea that, no, it can't work. You, you can't. We get this collaborative effort like it's just so foreign I think there's 200 years of industrial inertia everything is proprietary right so when I first did the TED talk I was like yes beautiful all these people coming at our door but you find that at the end of the day it's what can happen is limited uh, you need an infrastructure to harness that entire effort but first I think it's the the real intent of people who are committed to make this happen that is not there it's it's a lot of there's a lot of shallow effort but not the consistent model where you're literally saying hey we're going to reinvent the blueprints of civilization for how uh, R&D goes that's a bigger question so we're just get, I mean I think this year is going to be a place where we we'll get some serious cash flows happening and then we can bootstrap 
to further, further R&D to actually get this thing done. Because on the calendar, on our roadmap, 2028 is when we finish the entire Global Village construction set. So we've got a, like six years, seven years, eight years maybe. Mm -hmm. Ten. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's like six that are productizable right now. There's like 22 altogether, 20, actually it's more like 27 since last year. Um, and it's, but you have to consider that each one of these items is at least a million dollar budget. So we, we did just about right, you know, like two million bucks. We got like one or two things out the door. It's at the end of the day, you have to take the due diligence to, to make it all happen. Corporate budgets are, you, you, you plop down a couple of million on a project or a startup budget, plop down a couple of million, you develop the first prototype, go to market, things like that. It's, that's what it takes. But in open source, of course, the idea is that, oh, well, so many people contribute that it's actually all, we share the burden and it's all people pay with their sweat equity and time, just like Linux and we get it all done to great benefit to everybody. Well, it just hasn't happened for hardware. It's a mental block, collaborative liter literacy. We're optimistic and zealous. It's simply, you gotta create a product. You gotta use the, the old revenue generation thing, the bootstrap thing. The, the way we can scale this is by um, not, we're not taking any investment because I don't think that's that's right. It's like we're generating this whole class of people who are third parties that um, gain a share in the, in the enterprise. Uh, we, that would kind of defeat the purpose. We're, if we are to scale, because of course your investors, they're, they're going to want to be proprietary. So there's a little block there, uh, let's say. Um, but how do you scale this to the world? through open enterprise that anyone can replicate, but it has to ha rely on bootstrap business models, and that's what we're doing. So with a house, uh, the idea is you've got a product, you sell it, and you reinvest, and that's as simple as that. It's it's not too much magic. It's like uh, everyone's got a job. we got to start creating jobs where on your task queue, it's instead of working for a corporation, you have a viable option to work in distributed production as generated by this kind of movement in an open source micro factory. So it's about revenue models that are created that work and that can scale. So, so that's that's where we're at. Uh, so it's the product, the house. I mean, everybody wants a house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so so the initial rollout is, so it's modular construction, and we're not doing the first one with the brick press, because that's much harder. So we're using standard light framing, but it's modular. So that uh, the offer is a thousand square foot house. It's um, two, the initial model is two stories, but basically panel panelized so that you can either build it yourself or have a large event like we we typically do in order to build it. So it's not like you, you make the whole wall and you lift it up. You make four by eight modules, standard construction material like Legos. Uh, you build all the four, four by eight panels. There are the walls, the windows, the doors. And then you put a roof, you got a foundation and a roof on that. And then everything is designed to be highly modular. And that way we're, I guess the unique thing is about the integration of the entire process to consider the most effective way to build and a way that an unskilled person, I think I think the biggest thing is, is about allowing widespread access, which means that any single person can be able to do this. So the, the way it could work is you have your weekends off your job, you can build all the panels that go up, go into this house, and then in one week with a friend, you can assemble it so, so you got a complete house. Uh, starting The foundation has to be there already. But in one week, so two people, so 80 hours, build the whole thing from these pretty, pretty much pre-made modules that you can spend as much time as you need to, to get them done. That's, that's the kind of model. So you can allow people who have a job to do this, or you can just hire contractors to do this, or hire us. That's, so we're training people to, to be able to do this.
the brand name is called is called Seed Eco Home. Yeah. Why is it called Seed? Because it's fully expandable. So the way we designed it right now, the initial design is thousand square feet, but it's readily designed to add to it. So you can build a 2000 square foot model on top of that. So we're even like pre-framing the places where you, you will add. So you, you have like placeholders for doors and stuff like that. But because the, the method is completely modular, you can do this and the system is designed so you can start with a little home and grows with your needs. So you don't get like one crappy home that you can afford, you get a small quality home and then as time goes on, you build up. Because any structure out there is, I mean, the initial build is just about, it's actually about 20% of the entire building. When you consider all the maintenance, the additions and so forth, most of it happens afterwards. So you can, you can invest in something small that you can actually uh, live with for a long time because it's flexible. Yeah, heard about it. Well, for this, the market here is, uh, we initially thought, oh yeah, we can, this is the owner builder model where everyone's gonna build their own house. And, and after thinking about it, it's like, nah, they ain't gonna scale. Uh, we need to provide a turnkey product that you can hire us and we give you a house. So that's, that's here. And that will bootstrap the further developments where like, for example, the brick press, just doing some of the final refinements, we found that the last thing we need on that is a soil mixer that allows you to mix cement and soil so you can stabilize block to make it waterproof. That's like the last thing to make it fully industrial. We won't actually start selling these bricks as a viable building material like you get at Menards. But the thing is, uh, the initial level is, okay, let's get a house out there. We know that you can make money selling a house and we're gonna invest that to refine the further developments. Now we're doing using our own tractor to build it. We're printing trim, plastic lumber and foundation forms and plumbing fittings. And then we're going on to now here's your compressed earth block techniques. Here's the sawmill that, that if it's readily accessible, imagine a CNC sawmill, you drop a log, log to it and walk away and then you just got a pile of lumber. Like that, a techie person could do that. So, so mixing, uh, automation, the appropriate automation within all this process, and you can uh, avail this unbridled productivity on a small scale. All right, so that's that's the vision to just create more options for people, so you don't just have Menards or Lowe's Home Depot to go to. Because actually, right now there's a real shortage of lumber that the price of lumber went up like three times. Um, so that's a you know it's a practical thing too if you can generate your local materials. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And talking about So is there any real solution for that? I actually think there is with 3D printing. So each person in the United States generates like 100 pounds of waste, plastic waste that all goes to the trash. I mean, imagine taking abundant plastic waste and distribute production of 
say, uh, lumber, plastic lumber. You can get plastic lumber at the big box stores too. That's that's a technology that you ta you're taking the entire waste plastic stream and with a basic shredder and a filament maker, you can now start making filament to now start printing large things. Why can't you do that right now? Well, a spool of filament is 20 bucks. That would make for a very expensive two by four if you, <laughs> like a 40, $50 two by four if you did that. But if you reduce that, that price of the plastic by 10 to 100 X by going to waste plastic streams, then you're talking. So that, that's part of the initiative. We're gonna do this It's a very explicit part of the CD go home. Here's now plastic lumber technology that we can now lower uh, barriers to in this whole process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. The whole, the whole thing is about increasing our index of possibilities on industrial productivity on a small scale. So I mentioned the open source micro factory, right? So it's a community center where you can build your car, build your, your, your uh, telephone, build a cordless drill, uh, things like that. You can do everything in a local micro factory, but, but take it even smaller scale at the scale of a house. You got your garage, you can start something, but with a very simple, thing like the plastic recy uh, plastic recycling infrastructure combined with 3D printing. Imagine that. I could see that becoming an appliance just like you have a washer and a dryer today uh, where now you're just throwing your waste plastic and it's just simply a shredder. You pulverize it. You melt it down in just a little heat chamber and extrude it into a thin filament. That is not rocket science. And now you're printing. Yeah, but let me tell you one thing, and this is uh, this kind of goes back to our discussion about the lack of innovation today. The three printers have been the greatest example of a, an industry that's been transformed by open source. However, if you look closely, like from my perspective, innovation there is actually slow. For example, we have not, to this date, come up with a high temperature three D printer. Everything is pretty much ambient temperature or not super high. There's a way to do it where you have a heated build chamber that is so high temperature that you can now print with any plastic. Because right now you can't print with a simple stuff like polyethylene, polypropylene, uh, PVC is limited. But because the things warp and you need an enclosed hot chamber that's very hot, no single open source 3D printer in the world has that. It's like, guys, we came, came, with a couple, came up with 3D printers like five to ten years ago as open source, why aren't we going forward on it? It's also an example where there's no clear mechanisms of how you collaborate. Because once, say, a company like Prusa Printers uh, gets success, they continue and they now run a business and maybe not not worry so much about open source anymore. That's kind of typical. But, okay, I'm kind of diver diver diverging here. The missing link on that home recycling infrastructure is larger and high temperature printers. Now we've got a design and we want to release that and I hope we can change the world with this, but that's one of the things that's missing. So you got your plastic recycling infrastructure and a more capable printer that prints more than literally with like a couple of materials like PLA and ABS, where you can't hardly print with ABS even uh, because of the warping issues. You need this high temperature chamber that does not yet exist. So this is the call for innovation and a case for making a uh, home recycling industry standard for every individual.
There's two things. One, there are there are some open source uh, variants of machines that can shred and make plastic with, but none that can do it very well. So there's a technology gap there, like none of it that is reliable or cheap enough to do it. There's really good grinders, uh, but as far as uh, open source filament maker that can make anything you think there would be and you, you read tons about it oh yeah this one and that one but actually a lot of them like the ones you can buy they work with pellets very highly controlled pellets that you buy off the shelf which are still not recycled plastic really uh, to recycle plastic you have to have much more tolerance it takes more science because you're mixing all kinds of stuff in there and and rat hairs and dust and everything else you gotta have a process that's designed for to take everything uh, so it has to be a very robust good system that system does not exist yet the pellet make the filament maker that you can get it will run typically from commercial pellets not waste plastic typically yeah We'd like to do one for about two thousand dollars. There's a price point for the shredding and filament making infrastructure altogether. Mm -hmm. Micro factories, open source micro factories. It's true, that's, and that's why. That's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's why uh, our vision is 10,000 micro factories worldwide, just about in any city that you can do this at. Now for the home, if, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's... Well, that's what we're doing in September 2021. That's this year. So we're... That's, that's the idea. And the, let me just introduce another thing. So in August, about the middle of the month, we're going to do a weekend hackathon where we're inviting 2,000 people to collaborate on publishing 
the blueprints for the house and some work on a printer and the, and, and the tractor. So we're gonna do a very crazy, large scale collaborative event that depends on, it's still very simple tools. It's open source FreeCAD, it's Google Docs and collaborative editing, but we've got protocols where you can get masses of people where with mo module based design, you can put a lot of people to collaborate together on unprecedented uh, projects. Yeah. 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 Mm hmm Yeah. Yes, I did. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I think uh, a three D printer is a very good diverse diverse function tool that can get you. Because if you think about any of these things that you mentioned, what what are they made of? They're made of plastic, a microcontroller, an electric motor, maybe some screws and bolts. And with that, you have just about anything. So if you can make three uh, D print as far as the, the physical. Uh, structure of it. You can make your own circuits too. You don't have to make your own circuits. You got Arduinos and plenty other microcontrollers, electric motors. Yeah, this is all feasible so that a small, as I say, the open source micro factory can be producing all these crazy things and like your custom skateboard that's souped up for just for your needs. You can make it custom exactly for what you need. So you learn how to do open source CAD or you can download a bunch of designs from the internet and then manifest it in an open source micro factory where you have the, the appropriate tools. Now, the, the one thing I would like to add to that is you need some kind of a standardization. We call it tool chain degeneracy. We, that means you don't have like an infinite number of tools with infinite number of parameters that you can't control as a global network because there's too much variation. You can never manage it properly. So reduce it to the single best, most powerful set that's easy to maintain it's kind of like the standards in software or wherever. Um, but don't go nuts into creating a thousand different versions of a, of a screw. Just come up with like the few of the most important ones or like one best engine. I, I just want one best engine. I don't want 3,000 different ones. So, so agree to some standards, collaborate. But once again, that's the collaborative part. People kind of have are saying that wait wait where's my how am I gonna make a living then uh, my job is gonna be good but no it's a, it's about collaborating with uh, modern technology and others and computers to make life easy for everybody so we can do what we really want to do not be like working just so we can work and what do we really want to do is the real question yeah And you got your ball bearings right in there, and it's the start of all civilization. Yeah. 
Yeah. Not to mention the machine tools, like if you have a precision CNC mill to say mill apart, that has ball bearings are critical to that, so you get that precision. And then if you talk about space age or computer age, that's where air ball bearings come in. So that is super precise structures where one fit one fits in another. Like just a cylinder inside a inside a, a round thing that the friction there is no friction because it's actually there's nothing in there it's not oil it's just air that's called air bearings and that's what you have in turbines and high high vacuum pumps that make semiconductors the ball bearing the bear not but the bearing yeah air bearing ball bearing <laughs> hyperloop hyperloop yeah the, the train, yep. Mm -hmm. Somewhere like that, a little different, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. W well, with the concept, well, with the concept that there is no friction, yes, but in the air bearing, there's actually air in there. You want air. So it's, it's a little different, but the concept remains. Yeah, there's air versus vacuum, and vacuum is what you're talking about for the hyperloop. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I did lose some body parts. Like my finger is a little chopped off in my my brick brick press. Uh, if you can see that a little bit, but beyond that, nothing out of si nothing much outside of some psychological damage, maybe. <laughs> no, um, and that's why I, I actually meditate and I do that to kind of keep my mental hygiene. But I think the biggest thing, one of the biggest things, is um, that we learn is a lot of. If you talk about horror stories, it's about the governance and personality kind of things because we basically opened up this place as a, a place where people can come people come here for dedicated project visits but you know we one thing we learned is that without really sound governance and clarity of what people are doing it turns into a lord of the flies situation pretty quickly like this is a place where it's like we're completely open to to experimenting and doing different things but if you don't give people enough uh, structure People go nuts. So that's kind of like the biggest learning. It's like you need uh, governance. Like, like I, I guess I would say I was more anarchistic natured before. I mean, of course, I came from you know, higher education. I was in a system. But when I kind of, kind of dropped out of society in some way to live on a raw piece of land um, as an independent thinker, I was like, yeah, you know, we want to be responsible. I, we don't want government telling us what to do and stuff like that. Uh, Adam, you're from Texas, so we, you're in the Texas Republic there. Um, but, but I do appreciate much more about governance and like when you try to run a, an enterprise, there's got to be real clarity about operations and what the rules that we follow are. So that's there's been a lot of learnings of how how to do that because we've seen just con like personal conflict. I mean, I was personally to tell you, I was exiled, you can say exiled, voluntarily exiled. I mean, things got so crappy with, with some of the, the personalities that I just had to leave for like a month, you know, from my own house. I mean, that's crazy. So that's that kind of tells you like, you know, especially like with what's going on in politics, say about anarchy, it's like, no, we do need some governance. We gotta have sound governance. We gotta constantly improve it. So definitely this, this experiment here, the big challenge is going to be governance. How do you get people to collaborate and work together on this piece of land? You know, how how do you do it in a way that's better than now? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Ja. Yeah, so basically take what you know with the online communities, but then the, the extra layer of challenges, okay, but you're actually physically with these people. Think about that, yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's for people. It was more like in the early days when we started the project pretty soon, as I said in my TED talk, and people from all over the world began to show up. So we accept them. We basically invite people. Yeah, come on, d develop this thing with us, build the tractor, build the next next brick press or whatever. And that's that's what I'm talking about. Basically, dedicated project visitors who were there for multiple like a month or more. We kind of see that. After three months, uh, that's kind of when they go nuts. <laughs> it's like it just doesn't go work more than... It's like, well, the idea is about proper... <laughs> no, not yet. But, um, s but um, the thing is that unless you have a, a rigorous structure for so-called HR, you know, human resources, managing people, setting expectations, and so forth, uh, people need that. And, and me, like... You know, we're a lean team. We're just, just a few of us here. It's like I never provided that rigorous kind of leadership or, or uh, uh, I mean, I would call just constant feedback or like babysitting kind of thing. Like there's a department, there's a whole, if you're trying to do a co coordinated effort where people working to get on a project, you definitely need some significant infrastructure for management unless you're assuming that everyone is very evolved and completely aligned and completely collaborative, which is kind of not yet. I, I mentioned that collaborative literacy, I, I think is very much undeveloped in today's, today's society. So people don't know how to work together. And so, so there's a real issue there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we are setting this place up like we're going to basically run this as a school or like t between tech school and, and immersion education programs. So we definitely have to figure all this out. So we will need a community manager. We'll need a cook. We'll probably uh, have have staff like people who actually are are taking care of the facility, building things, growing food, uh, kind of like a, like a college. I, the best best example is like a university campus where you've got enough support staff that you can actually make it work. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. It's called it's called factory e farm. It's not a factory farm. It's a factor e farm where E is the exponential number. It's a tr about transcendence. It's a transcendental number.
Yeah. Well, I mean, the next big thing is, you might say it's the next big thing, but it's all part of the Global Village construction set, which the finish line is 2028, where we have essentially a, an appropriate technology infrastructure. But actually bigger than that, we're d developing these, these machines, these artifacts, but what we're actually doing is developing collaborative design and development protocols that can shift the economy from proprietary to collaborative. That is a much bigger question. That means like you're AT&T or you're John Deere. You're not doing what you're doing with your proprietary research. You're part of an open source effort that makes everybody better. Um, so a more distributed world. The next thing that we're, we have is like, if you want to help us out, there's the big hackathon in, sep in August, about middle of August. That's going to be a big thing. We need a lot of CAD people, designers, uh, graphics people, uh, publishing people, because we're going to basically write the, the big manual, the enterprise manual for how you build the seed eco homes. And then in, in September, we're going to do immersion where you actually learn to build the seed eco homes if you want to build them. Or we're doing a, a longer program for three months where you're actually getting trained on how to be an entrepreneur or a builder building these houses. So that, that's there's a lot of activity there, which includes the that in, does include the tractors and the 3D printers as part of that infrastructure. So if people want to help out, sign up online. There's a we have an interest form for the seed seed eco home. We're gonna we're gonna basically um, launch that as a public announcement probably by March 1st. So there's about six months before the actual uh, hands-on training. Uh, so that's a big thing. Or otherwise, buy our 3D printers. That's one product we offer uh, online right now. Mm-hmm. 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 Thanks, Adam, and thanks, Jared. This was great. All right. So what's the? Oh, thanks. Uh, so what's like a take home take home message that you guys get, Jared? Are you still disappointed about forget about it, or you're a little better? Yeah, it's about making it accessible to anyone. We, we just noticed, I mean, the barriers are significant to a lot of people, and we're saying, hey, we're going to make it easy. Click buy. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing I actually forgot to mention, I don't know, maybe you can guys be explicit and put it in the notes, but, but um, so the limit is like, yeah, it's, you know, it's a big project and all of that. But the thing we just just introduced is a mentorship program. It's like, okay, we've got all this know-how, but we need people to actually take this with an explicit in intent of starting an enterprise with it. So we're offering the mentorship for people who want to basically get the basically one-on-one -on -one coaching with me to get them going. And that's that's one, one thing we started because the thing is, it's like, we got to call out people and say, hey, this is hard. You really need some intense time to do this. You got to do this for like a year full time to get a business off the ground, according to our techniques. But that's that's the mentorship thing that we just started. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we're I'd say that's that word came up many times actually like when we talk about the seed eco home it's it's kind of like a franchise because we're saying hey we're going to enfranchise all these people to either they can completely go off on their own or they can get they pay for the the training very dedicated training with us. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Time's ticking. We gotta get our shit together. You have a you have a blog or mm -hmm. 
Okay. Mm hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Um. Yeah. I'll if I write something really cool about it, like like about collaborative literacy. Yeah, I have not just had enough time to do the blogging bit right now, by all means. And also, uh, when the when the big hackathon. I mean, this is like our biggest ever deal that we're organizing. But when that happens, can I give you pass that on so you can pass it on to your people? The hackathon, and then there's the immersion training the month after that. But we're going to be launching those, so you can pass it on to you guys. Post it. No, it's actually all remote. It's all remote because still because of the. The more immersion is going to be on site. That September is going to be on site. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, I mean, we have a YouTube channel with like hundreds of videos, like from history. I mean, a lot of it is kind of kind of raw-ish, but yeah, we. That's why I got some new DSLR equipment to, yeah, more polished. Yeah. Yeah, and so the new house that we're the house that we're building, we're actually gonna do a film studio in there. So I want to do something like that. I think the regular broadcasting that will be more in like the format of a podcast. Um, but yeah, we gotta get our uh, presence more out there. Just keep working on it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a full time job. So I'm gonna have to, to hire somebody for assistance on that. <laughs> I, I like to call it exterior trim with my chainsaw. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, definitely. I mean, the balance thing is, is huge. I mean, I pay a lot of attention to being physically healthy because like the, the workshop stuff, like I'm, I still exercise on top of that to get flexible because like the workshop is hard, kind of brutal work, like farm work. That's that's crazy, like building. So I pay attention to that, to eating. I also meditate. So, I mean, I, I really try to get balanced by meditation and yoga. So, yeah, definitely. Mm hmm Oh, uh, which which one comes to mind? Does a specific one come to mind? Specific episode? Yeah, the duty. Yeah, it's all interesting stuff. Uh, but you know what? Like, uh, just just to mention one thing, like from two thousand six when I actually got out here to the to the land, I did like until about four years ago I did not pick up like a single book because I was just so busy like ass in the grass just it was crazy but now appreciate much more that uh, I, mean, I actually have a coach I read a lot right now but but yeah it was just an intense episode where it was just ass in the grass and it just didn't have any time and, and basically like unlearning all the stuff that I learned it's like I thought I kind of knew everything and then just totally get crushed on it and then uh, now, like, totally about growth mindset and lifelong learning, which is going to be the basic contract for what we do here. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 But the good thing is, man, like, the more, like, the, that feeling of when you actually build something physical, it's like, right now I feel I can build anything. And also, that applies to my thinking about society. It's like, we can create new governance structures, we can create new realities, new communities, that all kind of comes with it. And it's a, it's a feeling that we're trying to communicate to many more people, because then we'd have many more empowered people, and we want that for the benefit of the world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we got it. Oh, oh, actually, yeah. <laughs> 